Hi, and welcome back to Computational Linear Algebra, Chapter 2, Points, Vectors, and Independence. And we'll be talking about the second part of the chapter. Um, we, last video, we looked at points, vectors, the difference, talked about vector fields, things like length of vector and combining points. Now we're going to look at the more advanced topics of independence, dot products, term, orthogonal projections, and a bunch of inequalities and how things work. So, what do we mean by independence? Right? If we draw two vectors, v and w, and they, they describe a parallelogram in general, but in the drawing we have over here, v and w don't describe much of a parallelogram. If this parallelogram has zero area, then the two vectors are parallel. Right? v is a constant or a scalar times w. Anytime I have two vectors that are a parallel, as they are here, because just one is a scalar of the other, they're called linearly dependent vectors. When the vectors are not parallel, they are linearly independent vectors. So when we say independent, we mean that the two vectors are not parallel. We don't say anything more about them. But as soon as they're parallel, they're very dependent. If you know one, you know something about the direction of the other. So two linearly dependent vectors may, may be used to write any other vector, u, as a linear combination. Because they're independent, they have two different directions, I can write any u as a combination of r times some r times v plus some s times w. So any two independent vectors are also called a basis for r2, or a basis for whatever space they're in. So if v and w are linearly dependent, then we can't write all vectors as a linear combination of them. Okay, Why not? Well, if think about it. If they're the same direction, if v and w are linearly dependent, then they lie on a line. If I try and write some other point u, that's not on that line, it's some weighted combination of v and w, I can't get there. There's no amount of going up this way and up that way that will ever get me to go to this point. Okay, So no u and uh, no r and s will satisfy this sort of system of equations we get by trying to write u as a combination of these two. Okay, But graphically you can sort of see this. So if you're a visual thinker, think of this in terms of independence means they don't lie on the same line. If they lay on the same line, then you can't get off that line. As soon as they lie off the line, then I can put them together in more interesting ways to combine them. So given two vectors, v and w, we want to be able to answer the question, are they the same vector? Are they parallel or perpendicular to each other? What angle do they form? And there's a bunch of related questions. And to do this, we're going to use a technique or a, a, a tool called the dot product. It allows us to resolve these questions. Okay? And we call it dot product because of how we write it. So we're going to write it, as we see over here, v dot w. Okay? That's the dot product. Now, if I have some two vectors, v and w, we know that the, this vector is v minus w. We also know that if they're at 90 degrees, then we know from uh, Pythagorean theorem that the length of this vector, if this is a right triangle, the square of this is equal to the square of this side plus the square of that side. We get all that. So if we put all that together, multiply them out, which you can do is, you know, on your notes. Uh, make sure you understand where they're going, especially if you have issues with algebra. So you can square all these out, go back to the definition of, of the magnitude and square, and you'll see that this works out to be v1 plus w1, uh, sorry, v1 times w1 plus v2 times w2 equals zero, okay? And if that's the case, then these two vectors are at 90 degrees. We call them then perpendicular, okay? So if w is perpendicular to v, then up to a scale or multiple, w is equal to minus v2 over v1. And that's true in lots of places. So if I have a vector and I want to find something that's perpendicular to it, if I have v1 and v2, I just take minus v2 and v1, and I get a vector that's perpendicular to the other one. If you're not sure why that happens, go back to this formula and work it out. You'll sort of see that if I have this as v1 times minus v2, I have minus v1, v2, plus v2 times v1, then that's going to equal zero. And so it's easy to see that that will work out. So in general, the dot product of two arbitrary vectors, v and w, is given by, that's actually the same formula, v1 times w1 plus v2 times w2. And now the question is, we already know what that means when it's zero, what is it going to mean when it's something else? So it's going to return the scalar s. By a scalar, we mean it's just a number. Um, and so the dot product also has other names. 
It's also called a scalar product because it produces a scalar, or the inner product, which is a more complicated to see why it's called that, but uh, it's another term for it. Um, by looking at this formula, it's easy, and if you're not, you don't see this as easy, then you should verify yourself that v1 dot w, sorry, v dot w is equal to the same as w dot v. It's a symmetric operator. If you don't see that, work out the algebra going back to this formula and check it yourself. So we can also think of it in terms of its geometric meaning. And if you're a geometry type thinker, this is definitely a, a, the way you'll probably want to think about it. If I think of v and w, and I look at the dot product between them, what we're really saying is what's the projection of w onto v. We can take the length of w times the cosine of the angle between them, and that gives us this h. And because this h is perpendicular, we get a right triangle here. You can work it out and show that h squared is equal to the length of w squared times 1 minus the cosine squared of theta, where theta is this angle. And that comes back to what's going on. And since it's a right triangle, we can simplify that to the v, v minus w's magnitude squared minus the magnitude of v minus the magnitude of w cosine squared. Um, and that gives us h squared. Okay? Um, this is also what's sometimes called the law of cosines. So we, get, we can actually derive the law of cosines from this that the magnitude of v minus w, the magnitude of that vector, v minus w squared, is equal to the magnitude of v squared plus the magnitude of w squared, this length plus that length squared, minus 2 times v, the magnitude of v times the magnitude of w times cosine squared. And this is what's a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. You all know what happens if cosine is perpendicular. So if it's cosine of 90, that's 0. This term goes away, and we get that this length is equal to the square of the length of the other sides. Okay, so the law of cosines is a useful thing from your trigonometry class. Hopefully you may have seen this already. But from a uh, linear algebra point of view, we're thinking of this now in terms of what it means from a dot product. So continuing that, right, we can look at this in many different ways. If we explicitly write out v minus w squared, we can write out the algebra, v minus w squared's magnitude is the magnitude of v squared minus 2 v dot w plus w squared. Relating those two, right, because now I have two different formulas for v minus w squared. I have this formula and this formula where we have the cosines and whatever. Canceling out the terms that occur, you'll see that v dot w is equal to the magnitude of v times the magnitude of w times cosine of theta. And this turns out to be a very useful expression for the dot product because now we can interpret this in lots of ways. And so let's continue looking at that. Um, for those who have forgotten what your cosine function is, it's this wave-like function. Um, and the cosine function, if you can't remember this, right, at 0, the cosine is 1. The sine function is, is different. At 0, it's equal to 0. Um, my way of remembering that is cosine comes before sine, so it starts higher than the sine. So at 0, cosine is the one that's up here at 1. And then it has this nice wave function. Going back to that definition of uh, the dot product, we can look at that. We can see that the cosine of theta is equal to v dot w divided by the magnitude of v times the magnitude of w. And as long as v and w are not having a certain property, we can do this. Think to yourself, when can we not do this? And the answer to that is, of course, is we can't do that if either v or w is the zero vector, because then we'll have zero divided by zero, and we don't know what to do with that term. So this is a formula for cosine of theta when, when both of the vectors have an actual length. Obviously, because of the way that we define magnitudes, the value of this is always between plus and minus one, depending on the sign of how those things are aligned. And when the perpendicular vectors, when vectors are perpendicular, cosine of 90 degrees is zero, we get this to resolve back down. So zero is equal to v dot w divided by their magnitude, but that means that v dot w is zero. That gives us, again, perpendicular vectors have zero dot product. Um, when they're the same or opposite direction, so when they're parallel or anti-parallel, v will be some constant times w. They're going to be linearly dependent completely. Then we'll have cosine. We put a k in for v. You see we just end up with k v uh, w squared's magnitude divided by k times magnitude of w magnitude of w. We've already seen that that's just the square. So that's going to give us plus or minus 1. So we also see that the dot product lets us know when the two vectors are 
dependent because their cosine will be either plus or minus one. So in general, triangles or angles come in three forms, right angles, zero, acute angles where the cosine is greater than zero, and obtuse angles where the cosine is less than zero. Um, and if for each of these, we can just look at the dot product. Is the dot product equal to zero, greater than zero, or less than zero? And that lets us know if it's right, acute, or obtuse. But of course, those are obtuse terms. We'll, I actually won't use them for you. Um, so if theta is needed, if I actually want to recover theta, then I have to use this arc cosine function. Don't have to worry so much about how to compute it, but every library you have for, for doing computing will be able to get you an arc cosine function. Uh, v dot w divided by the magnitude of v, the magnitude of w. And when you start programming this, this is when you have to go back and think about that check. When can you not do this? You can't do it when these have zero vectors, and then you have to think about it. Um, and so you have to handle that as a special case. So let's think of this as an example, do a couple things. Let's say I wanted to have these two vectors, v and w, 2, 1, minus 1, 0. We can do things like calculate the length of each vector, because we're going to need that. Magnitude of v is square root of 5. Magnitude of w is 1. And again, here's some intermediate terms. So if I want to know what is cosine theta, well, it's 2 times minus 1 plus 1 times 0 divided by square root of 5 times 1. So it's about minus 8.9. Um, note that in this class, when I go to work on exams or whatever, I would just, I'm not going to ask you for questions that require a calculator. I assume you all know how to do that. So if you left it as 2 divided by the square root of 5, I'd be okay with that. I need to know that you know how to compute them. You can calculate them on a calculator sometime later. Um, so if I want to know the degrees, the arc cosine of that is, uh, of this number is around 153.4. Again, you would use a calculator. Um, now, another way of thinking about this, which is a good way for you to think about checking. You might not need the calculator, but you should be able to check, am I in the right ballpark? So if I have these two vectors, I've got uh, v, 2, 1, and w, minus 1, 0, I should be getting something that has an angle that's a lot more than 90, okay? So that gives me something where I should be able to look at this, and if I'm doing this with a calculator, I can check, oh, 153, yes, that's good, that's about right, okay? If you got one of these terms wrong, you'll probably get something that's not even close to being greater than 90, and then you can go ahead and, and make sure that you're working through the formulas. If the answer was in radians, just as a reminder from your trig, I convert from degrees to radians by doing multiplying by pi and dividing by 180. And in this class, you'll be fine if you just use pi equals 3.14159. Many calculators and computers have an actual pi function. Um, when we get to more complicated linear algebra, you'll want to carry pi to more significant digits when you go to use it for uh, a bunch of other things. But for now, that's a good approximation. So the next thing we can talk about are orthogonal projections. And in fact, I already use this term uh, implicitly because that's just the way I think of what does the dot product mean. If I think about the projection of W onto V, it, calls what we, we create, it creates what we call a footprint. If I take this and I project it, I can get this point down here, which is its footprint. So the footprint, the length of B here, is the length of W times the cosine of the angle. And again, that just comes from right, Pythagorean theorem, if this is a right triangle, then cosine theta, sakatoa, if you remember sakatoa, cosine theta is adjacent over the opposite. Oh, sorry, the hypotenuse over the opposite. H in here is confusing. Um, so B divided by hypotenuse gives us a projection, and we can actually get all that back in terms of dot products. It's V dot W divided by uh, the magnitude of V squared, that gives us actually the little the value of b times the vector v. So we can get this term pretty easily. And notice now when I'm doing this, the nice thing about this is I don't actually have to think about cosines anymore. v dot w, remember that's just v1 times w1 plus v2 times w2, divided by the magnitude of v, v1 times v1 plus v2 times v2. Take that, multiply by b, and I can find out this point here. So I can get this projection of the footprint pretty easily. Now, we'll, we'll deal with this a lot more when we get to higher dimensions, but one of the reasons those orthogonal projections are interesting is they have some very special properties. First, I'll note, orthogonal projections are just a special case. That's where this is 90 degrees. I could have projected and came over here. Right? If you were thinking about how it might project if the sun was up here at the letter O, then it would be projecting way over here. So shadows are a kind of projection. 
but they're not orthogonal projections. Later in the class, we'll talk about how to do more general projections, but for orthogonal projections, this is how we can do them. Now, the nice thing about orthogonal projections is they actually turn out to be the best approximation to W in the subspace that is V. Now, in 1D, that's not really exciting as much, but when we get to 2 or 3D, when you're trying to find the best 2D approximation of a 3D object, it becomes a lot more interesting. And we'll come back to our orthogonal projections more when we get into that. But the other value of orthogonal projections is if I want to figure out how to, to represent data, if I can decompose W into sum of two perpendicular vectors, right, if you think about how we do our graphs, we often have our graphs with one perpendicular vector for this axis and another perpendicular vector for that axis. So finding two perpendicular vectors can be interesting. If you give me one vector u and another vector u perpendicular, then I can resolve w and its components with respect to these two vectors. u w, or sorry, uh, u orthogonal projection is w minus w dot v divided by v squared times v, right? which is what we just saw was the, the orthogonal projection. And we can also write that in a different form as just as w minus the projection on the v1 of w. And this is the component of W1 orthogonal to the space of U. Okay? This gives us, this, again, this idea. And when we get, to, again, to higher dimensions, we'll use this, uh, this concept a lot more. We're just introducing the, the formal definitions now. But when we go do things like Fourier uh, analysis, video compression, video digital audio compression and analysis, uh, even quantum mechanics, we do a lot of stuff where we work in orthogonal spaces. So this concept is important. But you can also see it's really pretty simple. It's how do I project perpendicular to a vector? And that's what we call orthogonal projections. Okay. Um, so a couple of summaries of inequalities that, that are useful and we will use from time to time. All of these can be derived just from the geometry. You can draw things and work stuff out um, from the definition of the dot product and Pythagorean theorems, the law of cosines. All of these follow. They're pretty straightforward. So the first is what's called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. It tells us that the dot product of v times w squared is less than or equal to the magnitude of v squared times the magnitude of w squared. This allows us to, given two of these, bound the other. So you can sort of see there are three terms here, the dot product, the length of u, the length of w, or v and w. Given any two, you can bound the other three. Okay? Um, and we can use that in some interesting way. So if I start with, how do I derive this? If I go from v dot w, just going back to its definition, Magnitude of V, magnitude of W cosine squared. If I square both sides, I take the square of this, I just get V dot W squared. Over here I get V squared's magnitude, W squared's magnitude, cosine squared. And then you note that cosine squared is at most one, always greater than or equal to zero, and so I can replace this equality with an inequality. Okay? Now, I can't do that without the squaring, because at this level, what would go wrong if I tried to relate these two with an inequality? Think about it. What can go wrong here? Why did we have to square both sides? Well, we have to square both sides because cosine could be negative. Well, both the magnitude of V and the magnitude of W have to be positive. If cosine was negative, then the inequality might go the other way. Right? I don't know which way it's going to go because I don't know if cosine is greater than zero or less than zero. But once I square it, I know that cosine squared is always greater than zero, and so I can replace it by dropping this term and making this less than or equal. So that gives us another way of looking at the, the deriving the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Um, a special case that many of you have seen is what's called the triangle inequality. The magnitude of V plus W, V and W, the magnitude of this vector, right, which is V plus W, which is V plus W. It's also the same as W plus V. But V plus W's magnitude is less than or equal to the magnitude of V plus the magnitude of W. And this is going to be true, and it's actually one of the things we expect to be true for any uh, Euclidean space. So in terms of what you should know now, let's look at a bunch of terms. If any of these terms, looking at them, give you a problem, go back and think about it. Is there anything here we didn't talk about? From the whole chapter, there's a couple of things I did not talk about here in these video lectures, um, one of which is the zero divide tolerance. If you don't know what that is, and you thought you did, you just looked at this and said, yeah, I know everything. Uh, sorry, there's a little bit of a trick here. I didn't talk about zero divide tolerance. Go back and read parts of the chapter for any of these terms you don't know. So now, just to, for some things to consider,
here's some questions you might want to be ready for in class. So consider a couple of vectors, in this case v and w. Make sure you know how to answer what's the angle between these two in, in vectors, in radians, and degrees, whatever. We actually did a problem very similar to this as an example. Um, consider the vectors v and w. What's the dot product of v and w? You should be able to compute that for any v and w we throw at you in class. Okay. Again, this is a video lecture. I suggest you stop. Make sure you can do this problem by hand. Um, you might also remember that there are a whole bunch of questions at the end of the chapter, many of which have answers in the very back of the book. So if you're not sure about this, you think you know what it is, but you're not positive you know it 100%, do it, check in the back of the book. If you're 100% sure, check quickly in the back of the book. <laughs> okay, another expression. So why is this expression, the following expression, half P plus half Q, why is it geometrically meaningful? Okay, be able to answer that, maybe be able to draw it. Um, although drawing it doesn't tell me that you know why it's geometrically meaningful. Um, so I'd also like to have uh, some of the terms discussed in this course and so you can answer it that way. Another sample question. Describe the above figure, and in this case I'm going to give you a multiple choice type question. Uh, is this point, does this have points P, Q, R, and S in it? Uh, it the points in this drawing are not collinear. They're bare sets or combination of three points, uh, A and B, all of the above. So those are the kinds of questions I might ask you. In fact, many of the questions I ask in class, because we'll be using clickers, will be using multiple choice questions. And here's an example of what I mean by describe. I could, in a quiz, ask you to just write out a description, and I would actually be looking for that. So in this case, the right answer is actually all of the above. Um, but I might also go a little bit farther. If you were to write this in a quiz, I would actually say the correct answer to this is a barycentric combination of points P, Q, and R to yield S. Oh, another question. Be able to do things like the orthogonal projection. We had some formulas for that. Again, my goal is not to make you memorize formulas, so you can just derive this from first principles and understand the geometry, and it's easy to do. Um, but make sure you can handle these numbers. Again, um, in general, I won't necessarily uh, have you do things with... Uh, calculators. Um, so if I had questions where you might need a calculator, there might also be something where you can have it in uh, a considered form. So compute, if I ask you to compute the cosine form by these vectors, um, the cosine of the angle in this case in radians, 45504, you can compute that. Um, in this case, you might also be able to reason about at least some of the answers geometrically, but these two answers are so close that if those are the answers you need, you're going to have to pull out a calculator to, to figure those out. So you might be ready to do that in class as well. Your phone probably has a calculator if you haven't thought about that. Get a phone app, a calculator app for your phone. Um, so some other questions, again, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. If V is equal to 4W, what's the area of a parallelogram by parallelogram spanned by V and W? Be able to work that out. Take some time. Um, do the dot products, do the vectors V1 and V2? which are 1, 4, and 0, 3, do they form a basis for R2? If so, yes. If not, why not? What is V dot W when I give you V and W? 5, 4, and 0, 1. What is the scalar product? Which is really the same question, right? So either one of those would be the same question. What are linear combinations? What linear combinations allow us to express U with respect to V1 and V2? So if this is U, and this is V1, and this is V2, you have to figure out what is some constant times v1 plus another constant times v2 that gives us u. Okay. Again, something we've described through the chapter. If that seems hard, you didn't think about how to apply things that we've discussed. Um, compute the cosine form of these angles. Answer the question, is that angle less than or greater than 90 degrees? Which is actually pretty easy because you don't have to do calculator stuff to get those answers. Um, given vectors v and w here, find the orthogonal projection of u of u onto w, sorry, of u onto w, find the orthogonal projection u of w onto v. That is, decompose w and its components u and u uh, perpendicular. Example we went through. Now apply to some real data. Make sure you've worked through an example so you know how to do those things. Given a vector v and w, under what conditions is v dot w squared equal to v squared w squared? Give an example. Um, this is clearly not a multiple choice question or a multiple choice question, so this is the kind of stuff you might see in a quiz or an exam. Um, 
given vectors v and w, under what conditions is v plus w's magnitude equal to the magnitude of v plus the magnitude of w, and again, give an example. So we might talk about these questions in class. I want to give you some heads up. Make sure you've watched the video, listened to the, read through the chapter, and then worked out a bunch of these problems. So that's it for chapter two. See you in class or in chapter three.